Welcome to Keith Knight, Don't Tread on Anyone. This is Demagoguery Explained by Brian Kaplan at econlog.org. In the dictionary, demagogues are bad by definition. In Merriam-Webster, a demagogue is a political leader who tries to get support by making false claims and promises and using arguments based on emotion rather than reason. In the Oxford Dictionary, he's a political leader who seeks support by appealing to popular desires and prejudices rather than by using rational argument. In the Wiktionary, he is a political orator or leader who gains favor by pandering to or exciting the passions and prejudices of the audience, rather than by using rational argument. In your calmer moments, though it's tempting to dismiss the concept, in practice, isn't a demagogue just a political opponent with a silver tongue? Isn't demagoguery simply rhetoric that hits political nerves you wish would stay eternally numb? But before you ditch the whole concept, let me propose the following refinement. Demagoguery is the politics of social desirability bias. The heart of social desirability bias. Some types of claims sound good or bad, regardless of the facts. Helping people sounds good. Acquiring luxuries sounds bad. Saving American jobs sounds good. Cheap nannies for the upper middle class families sounds bad. Supporting our troops sounds good. Sympathizing with the enemy sounds bad. Raising the minimum wage sounds good. Measuring disemployment effects sounds bad. Any competent philosopher can construct cases where what sounds good is bad and what sounds bad is good. For instance, the minimum wage, good as it sounds, would be bad if it sharply increased unemployment of low-skilled workers. But when our competent philosopher runs for office, he has a clear incentive to keep his doubts to himself. If X sounds good, saying, hooray for X, is a much easier way to win over an audience than sure, X sounds good, but let's calm down and consider the possibility that X is in fact bad. It's possible, I grant you that, X's only sound good when those X's are good. If so, we can safely ignore social desirability bias. To test this optimistic view, I propose the following thought experiment. Imagine we do vastly more X. Could you possibly declare? We're doing too much X, without cringing. If a government spends 10 times as much on terminally ill children, would you feel comfortable announcing, Government is wasting money on terminally ill children. If government spent 10 times as much on war heroes, would you feel comfortable shouting, Government gives too much to war heroes. Don't want to say such things ever, ever, ever? Then the policy views you and your fellow citizens cherish are probably infected by social desirability bias. The same goes for the Panglossian view that X sounds bad solely because X is bad. Imagine we increased our anti-terrorism efforts tenfold. Would that remove the stigma from saying, let's relax our anti-terrorist efforts? Not bloody likely. What then is demagoguery? Embracing social desirability bias to gain power. Making a career out of pra praising what sounds good and attacking what sounds bad. What's the alternative? conscientiously searching for and publicizing the many disconnects between what's pleasing to the ear and what's true. You could object that no public enemy of social desirability bias could succeed in politics. While I tend to agree that rationalization should terrify you, social desirability bias is a severe mental shortcoming, but to succeed in politics, you have to feed it rather than starve it. I know these claims sound bad, but if you reject them because they sound bad, you're only proving my point. Here are a couple examples of social desirability bias. When Mike Cernovich, someone who I really admire, made that excellent movie Hoaxed, says, Mike Cernovich, talking about himself, is pro-union, pro-trucker, and pro-America, using three American flags. So, to be pro-trucker, I asked... Uh, so my dad is a trucker. Do you support his right to purchase items from overseas unmolested? What if he wants to open up a company that uses self-driving cars to deliver? Can you be pro millions of strangers? And that's just it. I, I, I support good. I support our team. It's, it's not like basketball 
where all it means is we want more points. To be pro-trucker, well, truckers in one capacity drive trucks as a job. In another capacity, they're also consumers, so they might want to purchase things that aren't being made by the 5% of the world's population that are currently in America. You have no clue what's in the best interest of millions of strangers. What's it mean to be pro-USA? I mean, I'm so pro-USA, we'll go to war with anyone so I could protect this, uh, th this great land. Well, uh, maybe the wars that you enter uh, create terrorists because the U.S. government ends up killing civilians, which pisses off the populace, which makes them want to commit atrocities against Americans, who they hold responsible. It's not easy to get a hold of the president of America, so they'll probably take it out on civilians. What's it mean to be pro-union? Well, there's people inside of a union, and then there's other people who want to get a job who maybe don't have enough skills to join the union and start a job at $10, $15, $20, $30 an hour. So just saying you're pro-something doesn't really get at the heart of it. I'm pro-woman. Uh, well, what if there's a fetus who's a girl who's going to be a woman? I'm pro-woman. Okay, so if someone, if a woman wants to open up a business, you don't believe in regulating her? You don't believe in taxing women and taking money from them by force because you're pro-women, right? You're pro-education? Does that mean you want a trillion dollars spent by the U.S. federal government in education? Or does being pro-education mean you want the state out of government because the state creates poor quality? Here is another example. Ocasio-Cortez, uh, in response to, how is the start stock market fine when everything else is, you know, definitely not from Emily Stewart? The answer is, is because the, fled, uh, the Federal Reserve uh, printed a uh, couple trillion dollars. Actually, they didn't even print it. They just added it to the money supply. So uh, instead of uh, the free market being in money in 1913, the state granted a monopoly to a bank. Um, so this is obviously the fault of the state. A possible explanation with the caveat, as one source puts it, if I'm being dead ass honest though, nobody knows what's really going on. Nobody knows what's going on. People like Peter Schiff weren't talking about how the Fed uh, inflates the money supply and how it disincentivizes people from saving and postponing consumption because if they just save, they don't earn enough money because the Fed has arbitrarily lowered interest rates. Nobody knows what's going on. That just means you hang around idiots. So our great representative says, hint, it starts with a C and ends with capitalism. The federal government giving a monopoly to a bank, legally a monopoly to a bank, and that bank printing money or entering money into uh, the economy is capitalism? By what definition? AKA, this is what happens when Wall Street captures Congress and writes themselves a bailout check after bailout check as working people die? How are bailouts part of capitalism? If anything, they're part of socialism. If there wasn't a government infringing on capitalist acts between consenting adults, who would be there to bail them out? This relies only on the ignorance of people who don't understand that communism is... The theory of the communist may be summed up in a single sentence abolition of private property. Socialism, the institutionalized interference with or aggression against private property and private property claims. Capitalism, a social system, a social system based on the explicit recognition of private property and non-aggressive contractual exchanges between private property owners. These are the only consistent definitions. Um, because uh, to, to say that capital is when there's owners and then workers, well, the state could do that. Um, any organization could, violent or voluntary, that doesn't get at the heart of the issue. So she's blaming freedom for what the state does. Uh, this is just, this is absolute demagoguery, relying on the ignorance of the populace, which you'd think she was so terrified. Look, these people have been educated for 12 years in government schools. I won't be able to get anything past them. But no, the goal of schools is to make you an idiot so you fall for this bullshit. Finally, we have Senator Sanders, demagogue. I am proud that at NEA Today, National Education Association, 
which represents 3 million educators, supports our College for All Act. So college uh, that assumes people are getting an education uh, when they go, it, how do you know they're not learning things that are false? Do people who go do people who go to college have a better understanding of the world around them than people who just research online? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. So just saying that we need X for all isn't really getting at the heart of an issue. You're not explaining a concept. For all act. Canceling. Uh, it's like, uh, uh, where did I put the trash on my computer? Canceling student debt. That's all you have to do. Put it in the trash and then empty the trash. Let more people to follow their passion to teach public school. Canceling. It's not yours to cancel. You weren't part of the capitalist voluntary ex non-aggressive contractual exchange. And tuition free. So teachers aren't going to get paid um, if you're a construction worker. You don't get paid to build the building because it's um, it, it's free. I mean, there's, there's no tuition. Um, this is literally like saying, you know, restaurants are free. I mean, yeah, you, you give them a piece of plastic and they swipe the plastic, but, but that's it. It's just free. You don't have to pay for it. And trade school. Oh, th the more free stuff he offers to spend other people's money on, the cooler and more moral he is. Only an evil demagogue would know people are so stupid that they'd fall for this shit. Ensures education as a right. It ensures it. Does government ensure safety? So if I so if I find examples of people not being safe in America when government police say we're here to keep you safe, do they really ensure protection? Well, of course not. Um, uh, does government ensure a justice system? No, there's tons of injustice. Do they ensure you are represented? Uh, of course not. Uh, government currently ensures K through 12 education but they crank out morons, so they can't ensure education um, as a right. And if it were a right, then I would have the right to walk up to any human and say, give me money so I can pursue an education. If you don't give me money, you are violating my rights. So therefore, you can just pretty much steal anything you want to, so long as you use some of that money for education. He, of course, also thinks health care is a right. Give me education. Give me health care, give me a house, or you're violating my rights. In order for it to come into existence, it has to be made by someone else in the first place. So you can't have a right to someone else's labor. But not surprising, uh, Democrats thinking they have a right to other people's labor. The party of slavery, Jim Crow, and the KKK. Here is Brian Kaplan to further explain demagoguery and the mindset of social desirability bias. What is social desirability bias? Ah, great question. Uh, social desirability bias is one of the most important and well-validated ideas in all of psychology. It says that when the truth sounds bad, people lie. And often they get sucked up into their own lies so much that they start to believe completely nonsensical things. All right, so some of the most obvious examples of this are if you ask people if they went to church, a higher share of people say they went than really did when we go and look at bodies that were there. If you ask people how much money they give to charity, people will claim to give more money to charity than they really do. If you ask them how much they drink, they claim to drink less than the actual sales of alcohol show that they do in fact drink, right? If you ask them things like, you know, are, you, are, are you a better than typical driver? More than half the population says that. Uh, if you ask people, you know, how kind are you compared to others? How generous, right? Then for all these things, we see that there is a gap between what sounds good and what really is happening. Or, you know, one of my favorite ones is if you ask people, if you were pregnant with a Down syndrome baby, would you abort? Most people say no. Yet we have numbers on the fraction of people who find themselves in that situation saying that a very large majority do, right? It's the difference between what sounds good and what people actually do in fact do, right? Now, this is a you know, very general idea, and you can and once you really appreciate it, you can see it almost everywhere. But in particular, I say you can see so much of this in politics. For example, you'll see in politics that people will say completely nonsensical things, like nothing's more important than education. And I don't care what your what your ideological views are. This is an absurd statement. Food is more important than education, obviously. 
obviously. Right? If you either have food or no education or education, no food, which one are you going to choose? Right? Or when people say things like, it would be better, if we, better to, for, for us to go to war than to lose one inch of territory. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, really? It's ridiculous. Who can, one inch of territory is not very important and the war would be terrible. Right? And, then, you know, and, and once again, you can obviously see that when people are talking about war, politicians make a bunch of statements why, that are cheered uh, with great vigor by their people saying, we will die before we surrender. And yet, what does every country do when they actually have to choose between death and surrender? They surrender. You know, so you know, perhaps the most obvious case being in Imperial Japan, when their rhetoric of, of death and their glorification of death is off the charts, and yet a couple of nuclear bombs get dropped, and like, well, there's death, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know, it's, it'll be all right. So that's what we see, right? And I say that when you listen to the, regula to the justifications that people give for a lot of government regulations, government ownership, when you actually listen, it really just does come down to social desirability bias. And you know, it's, uh, the people say what sounds good without really thinking about whether it will, whether it will work well. And, you know, so sometimes I think people are lying. I think more often it's just that people have heard the lies so much that they actually have internalized them. So things like you know, you know, the minimum wage is it was just great. It's just a way of helping workers. Like, it sounds good. Like, what about a million wage of $100 an hour? Wouldn't that have some bad effects? So you don't really favor that, do you? So then what makes you think that having a $15 minimum wage, for, uh, you know, $15 per hour minimum wage isn't bad, right? And same thing goes, you know, like with many complaints about immigration, things like if one American is harmed, it's like, tell me anything good that has ever happened that didn't harm one American. Yeah. Like Uber. Uber harmed many more than one Americans. You know, the mechanization of agriculture harmed many Americans. So what, we're not going to allow any kind of progress if there's one person who shares my citizenship who's harmed by it? Again, it sounds good. It's the kind of thing you say in a speech, but it's ridiculous.